Um, yes, first, thanks for having me today. I feel like a bit of an intruder coming in as a certain student, as I was saying. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, so my name is Sylvia, and I'm a PhD student in economics at Curtin University. And my thesis is titled Modelling the Price of Australian Wheat, a Maximum Entropy Density Approach. So, as is suggested by the title of my thesis, I'm indeed modelling the price of Australian wheat. And I'm using a statistical framework called Maximum Entropy Density. So, in modelling the price of wheat, it can help us understand the characteristics and the behaviour of the price of wheat. And it also provides a framework to forecast the price of wheat, so make predictions of the future price of wheat. Um, yeah, so this sort of information can be useful not just to researchers like us, but also to other stakeholders or forecast users like farmers, government, government and industry bodies, uh, banks, policymakers, and so on. So today, what I'd like to do is just share some of my current research. So I'm writing a journal article at the moment, and I'm going to provide a brief overview of my thesis as well. So as I mentioned, I'm currently writing a journal article. It happens to be a survey paper, sometimes called a review paper. And it's a review of the Agricultural Commodity Price Forecasting Unit. So whenever anyone writes a review paper or a survey paper, what you do is you try and collect all of the articles in that literature and summarize it somehow. And one of the ways I attempted to summarize uh, this academic literature was by categorizing the articles. So I use many different categories, one of which is the forecast type. I'll talk about that in a minute, but I categorized how the articles produced, not how, sorry, the kind of forecast that the article produced or the paper produced. So once again, I will talk about that in a minute. Um, you see something flashing on the screen. Is everything okay with you? I just saw the little corner flashing, so I wasn't sure what that was. Oh, okay. Because when someone can hear us all, but not really. That's okay. That's it. I'll just continue. Just let me know if you want to stop and fix any technical stuff. Yeah, so I categorize the articles by the type of forecast they produce. And I will talk about that in a moment and let you know what that means. But what was really interesting by using this particular category is I found that there was a gap in the literature. So it's an area that requires a little more research or a little more investigation. Oh, before I move on to that, I did want to just let you know that the papers forecast all different kinds of agricultural commodities. So not just wheat, other grains, cereals, pulses, oil seeds, horticulture, animal products, and so on. And they use all different kinds of modeling methods as well. And they broadly fall under the cat four categories one of which is structural econometric, time series, machine learning, and hybrid methods. So as I mentioned, I categorized according to forecast type. And typically there are three kinds of forecasts, point, interval, and density forecast. And honestly, the easiest way to understand the type of forecast is by going through an exam. So let's do that together. We're going to produce a point, interval, and density forecast. And say we'd like to produce a forecast of the price of wheat next month. I'll give you a very simple example. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of modeling technique we're using. It could even be an expert opinion or our own subjective judgment. We could produce these kinds of forecasts. Before I go through those, I'll let you know what you're looking at on the screen. So on the top, you see a line with the prices and a dot in blue on top, or a point on top. That would be the point forecast. Below that, there's an interval forecast. It's the one with the dashed line on either side of the point. At the bottom of the screen, you can see three density forecasts. 
let's start with a point forecast. So a point forecast would say something like, I estimate that the price of wheat next month will be $300 a tonne. What you might not realise is that a point forecast is usually something like an average or other measure of centrality. So what the point forecast is actually saying is, I estimate that on average, the price of wheat next month will be $300 a tonne. Let's move on to the interval forecast. So the interval forecast will say something like, I estimate that the price of wheat on average next month will be $300 a tonne. I'm also 90% sure that the price of wheat will be between $200 and $400 a tonne. So the point forecast in the top graph is simply that point, $300 a tonne. Below that is the interval. There's actually prediction or confidence intervals around that point forecast of $300. So that's why it's called an interval forecast. The difference between the two is that the point forecast has no measure of the uncertainty associated with the forecast. The interval forecast is giving you this confidence interval saying, hey, I've got some certainty or uncertainty around this forecast. Let's move on to the density forecast. So I'll bring your attention to the uh, center density here. And I've constructed it in such a way so it does actually correspond with the above two lines. So a density, if you don't know what that is, it's all right. It's actually pretty straightforward. So a density is also called a probability density function or a distribution or a PDF. Let's have a look at this density. So if we look at the highest point of that density, it's at $300. That corresponds to the mean or the average. So just like the forecast above, according to the density forecast, the price, it estimates that the price of wheat next month will be $300 a tonne. We could also ask another question. What's the chance or the probability? So a density will give you the chance or the probability or the likelihood of many different scenarios of price. What if I want to ask the question, what's the chance or the likelihood that the price of wheat will be between $200 and $400? Well, how do we work this out? All you need to do is calculate the area underneath the curve between those two points. And I've constructed it in such a way so that it corresponds to 90%, just like the interval forecast. But that's not the only information we can derive from a density forecast. For example, what if I ask the question, what's the chance that the price of wheat will be less than $175 a tonne? Well, I could actually answer that question here. So we find the point 175 on the graph and we calculate the area underneath the curve corresponding to less than 175. So I haven't actually worked that out, but let's just say it's about 3%. So we can actually answer those sorts of questions. And that's very much related to estimating the risk associated with the price of wheat forecasting for next month. So from the context of risk management and decision making, perhaps having a density forecast can be more valuable or more useful. The difference between the three point forecast, no estimate of uncertainty around the price forecast. Interval forecast, some estimate of the uncertainty around the forecast. Density forecast, full description of the uncertainty associated with the forecast. So before I move on to the next slide, I did want to bring your attention to this graph on the left. Perhaps you can see it's a little bit skewed to the left. So there's actually more area underneath the curve to the left of $300 than to the right. This means that there's more chance or probability of a price being less than $300 a tonne than more than $300. So this sort of information can be really useful. And what's even more, I was about to say interesting, but I'm not sure if it is for everyone, but what's more interesting to me is that if you didn't construct the density forecast and this was the true forecast density <coughs> and we constructed an interval forecast, you can see that it's symmetric about that point. It's 90% sure, so there's 45% on either side, $100 on either side. 
If this is the true forecast density, then actually there's more chance less than than greater than. So the interval forecast may be inaccurate in that case. These sorts of things, it's not the case that everyone would be interested in a density forecast or an interval forecast. It's just that from the perspective of risk management or decision making, it can be more useful to have this extra information. Perhaps you remembered that I categorized the journal articles based on the forecast type. So point, interval, or a density. And I prepared a pie chart. <laughs> so there's a whopping almost 85% of journal articles that forecast agricultural commodity prices that produce point forecasts. Runner up is interval forecast at about 10%. And lucky last at about 5 to 6% are the density forecast. Uh, yeah. When you say, um, is, it, is that that they were unable to to generate interval forecasts or, and that they just didn't choose to, or that they didn't choose to actually report them? Well, that's a really interesting question. So, Because sometimes, you know, produce yeah. a paper and you, you just you just report the point forecast, but actually your, the method used is quite capable of generating an interval forecast. That's right. Yeah, so certainly interval and point forecasts are very closely related. It might be quite easy to produce an interval forecast. And um, I was about to say, I'm not going to try and hypothesize as to why they didn't produce one. I think if we look at it from a decision-making or a forecast user perspective, I'm just saying perhaps it is more valuable to have a density forecast. So I'm not saying that it's bad that they produce point forecasts in any way whatsoever. Their methodology suggests that that's interesting mm -hmm. and so on. But I suppose when we're looking at from an estimating risk kind of perspective, well, it probably is more useful to have a density forecast. A lot of the models have the capability to produce, as you're saying, an interval forecast. It's quite easy as an extension. A density forecast, it really depends on the kind of modeling you're using. Um, but Generally speaking, no, definitely <laughs> a density forecast uh, requires more of a computational investment than a point forecast. Depends on the modeling type, and they might not be interested in producing uh, density forecasts. But that's, you know, they're, they're kind of question marks around the literature as to um, maybe it would be useful to kind of, we're producing forecasts of agricultural commodity prices. So maybe from the perspective of the forecast user, it would be useful or valuable to have that kind of description of the uncertainty associated with it. And it, the framework is certainly there to produce interval or density forecasts. Um, yeah, so that's the paper that I'm writing at the moment. By no means is this the focus of the paper. It is a survey paper, so I talk about the methodologies used and the different um, commodities that they're forecasting and the prices of them rather. But I am making a case um, for density forecasting as maybe a cool thing that could be added to in the literature and, and just wondering why it's not really that explored in that literature. Um, it certainly is in other areas of economics and finance. Um, so my thesis title was modeling the price of Australian wheat a maximum entropy density approach. So I'm trying to highlight the word density in that. So I'm modeling the price of Australian wheat using a density. And so it means I can produce density forecasts. The method that I'm using is called maximum entropy density. Now, when you look at this, I just needed some sort of pictorial representation of what MED is, and here it is. This is just the functional form of MED. And I won't talk about this too much, so don't fret. You might be familiar with a normal distribution. So when you fit a normal distribution to data, you estimate two parameters, the mean and the variance. With MED, the user specifies how many parameters they want to estimate. It's the lambda there that you can see. So if we restrict lambda to two, they correspond to the mean and the variance. If we want to explore four of the lambdas or the parameters, well, that corresponds to the mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis. Oh, I wanted to just quickly 
So plot this distribution there as well, just to show you that a distribution can be shaped in many different ways. So the mean variance skewness stephosis, let's call it the characteristics of the distribution can look really different. I mean, it depends on the data itself and also the kind of modeling method you're using. I'll touch on that in a moment. You might be wondering like, why on earth would I choose MEV when there's other distributions out there? Like, maybe you're wondering, maybe you're not. MED is actually found by maximizing something called Shannon's entropy, subject to a set of moment constraints or conditions that we'd like the distribution to have, so or the density to have. So maybe you'd like to have it have some particular mean or variance for whatever reason, or skewness and ketosis. You can set those conditions and you solve Shannon's entropy or you maximize Shannon's entropy and you find this functional form here. What's really interesting is that under certain conditions or moment constraints, the MED will yield distributions or densities like the normal, like normal student T, the by written beta gamma, exponential weevil, all sorts of really commonly used densities. So in this way, the MED is actually a flexible approach to estimating the empirical density of the data. So rather than just choosing one of these distributions and fitting it and saying, this is the shape of the data. There's another approach that we could use, which is MED, it's a little bit more flexible that could result in one of these densities anyway. But the thing is, if we choose one of these densities and force it onto the data, we might be applying way too much structure to the data and kind of missing out on some of those details. What I mean is like the shape of the distribution. Remember when we're estimating risk, the shape of the tail of the distribution, like is it skewed? How fat are the tails? That's really important. So if we use a flexible distribution like an MED, it can actually help us improve our estimates of risk. MED also allows us to do some other interesting things. So MED allows us to allow the characteristics of the model to vary. So the characteristics or the characteristics of the density to vary. The characteristics are the things like the mean, variance, skewness, and ketosis. So the shape of the distribution. Is it skewed, the location? That is the distribution. Thin is the distribution, the fatness of the tables. These characteristics can actually change over time. And this work is very much related to structural break, if you've heard of that before. So if there's a shock in the system, it can cause a structural break in the actual time series. Here I'm looking at price. And it's very important to actually accommodate for these characteristics that might change over time. Again, from the perspective of estimating risk. Why might the characteristics of the price of wheat change over time? Well, I've given some examples here. Climatic events, financial volatility, socioeconomic events, food shortages, supply chain disruptions, extreme rainfall, frost, drought, and so on. It might actually cause the characteristics of the distribution to actually change over time. Um, when I presented at the AARES student conference, I actually spoke about this in particular, um, and I constructed a statistical test, it's a novel test, um, to test if the parameters do change over time for my series, and they do, indeed do. So it's a great framework, MED, to actually allow for this. Another thing that MED allows us to do I'm not saying that only MED allows us to do this. In fact, many, many models allow us to do this. Going back to the previous slide, allowing the characteristics to change over time, it's kind of analogous to, if you're familiar with Gartz modeling, we allow the variance or the conditional variance of the model to change over time. MED though also allows us to, uh, allows the characteristics of maybe the skewness and the ketosis to change over time. And in fact, these, the GARCH and the MED are not mutually exclusive. You could allow these standardized residuals to actually follow an MED if you'd like to, and allow the higher moments of the skewness and the ketosis to change over time. In fact, there's a literature all about that as well. 
Yes, so MED allows us to include covariates in the model, sometimes known as determinants or drivers. So the kinds of covariates that I'm including in my model are things like rainfall, temperature, southern oscillation index. Uh, just quickly, the southern oscillation index is a proxy uh, or kind of measure, a proxy for the El Nino and La Nina events, which can occur uh, globally, and they actually affect the weather, particularly over east, um, not as much here, but then they affect the yield of wheat, and that of course affects price as well. Uh, financial variables like foreign exchange rates, we export wheat. Uh, futures prices, so here I'm talking about specifically the wheat futures market, and speaking to those in the industry, they say that the wheat futures market has a huge impact on our spot price of wheat as well. Uh, crude oil prices, export prices of wheat from competitor countries. With other variables, I just kind of lumped them together because I didn't know what to call them. Freight costs, uh, wheat exports, and import volumes. Huh. So why is this important? Or why is this interesting? So I think at the beginning of my talk, I said that if we model the price of wheat, it helps us understand the characteristics or the behaviours of the price of wheat. By doing this, I can actually identify what are the main drivers of the price of wheat. I can also, I'm not there yet, so don't quiz me too much on this, this is like further down the line of my PhD, but hopefully this is one of the goals, is that I can actually forecast the price of wheat under different scenarios of the covariates. I'll give you an example. These are really pipe dreams, but we'll see if I get there. Let's take rainfall. So rainfall has a huge impact on wheat yields and probably wheat price as well. So I could have two different scenarios of rainfall, one with adequate rainfall and another one with inadequate, so maybe a drought condition. And I can forecast price under these two conditions and see what happens. Rainfall where? Ah, yes. So I'm not specifically spoken about the data that I'm using, but please go ahead. Well, I would, I would say that the, the Australian wheat price is probably uh, affected most by rainfall in Canada and the US, not in Australia, because Australia is a price taker. Mm. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And I will write that down. There's absolutely no reason why I can't put that in the model as long as I uh, uh, have that data. There's, that's another reason why I have the export price of wheat from competitor countries in there as well, for example. Um, at the moment, the data on rainfall I have is from the bomb. So I have, the, I don't know how many stations, many, 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 many stations around Australia. So I could pick some of those and pop them in as well. Um, when I get to that point, I'm not quite there with my PhD there. I think there'll be a lot of exploration around that for sure. Well, if, if, you get, if you're including prices from the US, mm. you're probably going to be explaining most of the Australian price, give or, give or take a few quality adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Baltic countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what do people tend to do when they want to predict the price in terms of are they using the uh, uh, to trade models? It's all typical. What do they use to, uh, to predict? Hmm? Oh, you mean the futures prices? Uh, yeah, no, just the consultants. Oh, well, what the consultants yeah. use? Yeah. So they're um, trade secrets. <laughs> so that might give you an idea of what's yeah. the most important players. Sure. And what to introduce. So if we're talking about farmers making decisions uh, on site, about, you know, they do enter uh, forecasts of price into their models. Uh, you know, this is only me speaking to those industry and researchers yeah. in weekly unit production. Um, so the very most basic thing they do is just take the price they last received and pop that into the model. I do know that farmers then do have their brokers or their consultants and they speak to them. Where the brokers and the consultants get their data from, question mark, I, I don't actually know. And there's also government organisations, um, external industries that use a variety. So ABARES, for example, produces forecasts on price. Um, I have contact um, and he also works in... Uh, wheat price forecasting amongst other agricultural commodities and they use a linear regression. Um, so the industry methods are quite different to what you find in the academic literature. Um, so in the academic literature, I think, oh, I don't want to say too much, but sometimes 
uh, perhaps you've stumbled across this new variation of a model that you're interested in, you go ahead and apply that to your data. In terms of the, the methods used in the academic literature, lots of different methods, time series methods, structural chronometric, not so much now, but back in the day, um, machine learning methods from people in machine learning. But again, in the industry, there's a variety of methods that you used. Yeah. Um, let me know if I didn't answer your question. No, no, that's okay. I, I was yeah. just trying because yeah, I'm looking for why I was Ah, yes. Prices and the people whose job is to predict these prices, mm. either using time series models or other trade models and so on. Yeah. That would be a good place for, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the places that matter. Yes, Canada. that's right. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, I do speak to, to those in the industry and they and they do happen to say, um, yeah, that the prices in Ukraine matter, the prices in Russia matter, the futures prices um, matter as well, um, also the crude oil prices and so on. But I think they derive it from their expert opinions as well as the kind of modeling that they use. So a uh, contact told me that they did linear regression and they found that some of the multiple linear regression. So they found some of these covariates were more important than others, for example. And that helped them conclude that, ah, yes, um, that that's in the line with what I believed um, based on my subjective opinion. So, so yeah, so I'll just provide a brief summary of my thesis. Um, now, well, I've already given you a summary of it, but just to give you a nice little picture. Uh, so, as you know, I'm forecasting the price of wheat. I've not specifically said uh, what prices I'm looking at at the moment, but um, I'm looking at a variety of different grades of wheat. So, Australian premium white, Australian standard white, and Australian hard. So, they're different grades of wheat. Um, and I have the export price received and a number of the main exporting ports around Australia. Uh, the data is actually all the time series, it's more stationary for every one of the series. So I know I was talking about forecasting price, but I just allowed it to, um, I just did that for simplicity, but I've actually taken the first difference, which is basically the price, the difference in the price from one day to the next, for example, and I'm predicting the uh, returns, but there's ways to reconstruct the price series using maximum entropy density. And I have three main outcomes. There's many, many different outcomes, but I think this is in the context of how I was talking about my project today. Um, I can identify the main drivers of the price of wheat. So that's what I talked about in the previous slide, with you know, rainfall and foreign exchange rates and so on. I can estimate risk. So perhaps you remember that question that I asked when I have all those densities on the board. What's the chance that the price of wheat will be less than $175 a ton next week? So that's an example of estimating risk because um, I'm not sure if you remember, but the average is 300. I made up these numbers, by the way. <laughs> but they're approximate. But if we looked at the tail of the distribution, so we're looking at risk, like, oh, what's the worst case scenario? What's the chance of that happening? So we can estimate risk from that model. Um, if you're familiar with finance, quite related to value at risk, for example. And I can forecast price as well or return. I believe that's my last slide. The next one is simply the Zoom link. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you very much for having me today. Um, I guess there's probably time for questions. I don't know if I need to turn on the other mic, perhaps. Just hit that. Um, the the yes, here it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe I have, yeah, I can hear a little rustling there. So the mic is on. Um, if there are any questions, um, feel free to ask me. Yes. So, um, what time period in terms of forecasting forward are you, are you interested in? Is uh, it about daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, or is it quarterly? Uh, sorry, so uh, what, what am I interested in forecasting? Yeah. Like the forecast horizon? I don't know. Um, this is an interesting question. So I am not quite there yet. What's interesting is that I have daily data. 
And the question is, do I aggregate the data and then put you know? <laughs> so, so, so here's here's one of the reasons. So this is one of the reasons. The good thing is I do have daily, so I can aggregate that way. But luckily, I'm not trying to turn monthly data into daily data, so that's a positive. So the reason why I say that is because a few of the covariates are actually at a lower frequency. So it might be monthly. So like the Southern Oscillation Index, there's no reason why you collect that on a daily basis because it measures the, the pressure difference between like Darwin and Tinkle, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so looking at it on a daily change is just telling us slight weather variations. But speaking to those in the industry, they're saying, well, the Southern you know, El Nino and La Nina have a huge effect on plants. So this is a bit of a tangent, but I will we'll veer back to that question in a second. So um, I'm actually not quite there yet. I have daily data. I could certainly forecast. I'm, I'm having a bit of a conundrum here. It's like, okay, I can, from an academic perspective, it doesn't really matter because I can just go ahead and forecast the price of wheat tomorrow. You know, I could produce, and then the day after, and then the day after that, or next week, for example. But then I have this conundrum around. Well, if I'm talking about the usefulness of the forecast, I don't think I don't think a forecast user would that be that interested in the price of wheat tomorrow, considering they probably have the price of wheat they received yesterday or the day before, which is likely not to be that different unless there's some crazy occurrence on that day. Um, so again, like many things in my thesis, it's a question mark um, at the moment. But if you have any um, one of my uh, supervisors, my co-supervisors said, just ask lots of questions as well in the question time. Um, because I'm, I'm not typically from ag as well. So if you have anything, um, I'd give you two questions here as well. If you're going, I just might be being set up in a competition. In some sense, if you're going out long periods, well, that's what future prices are trying to do. Yes. I think mean, they're actually trying to predict that in a year. Well, yeah, so it'd be interesting to just, I mean, unless we're to be integrating all the available information at the point in time, I should be interested to see whether your models can outperform the futures. Mm -hmm. In which case, you can give up academia and you can just go and yeah. make money trade. <laughs> um, but I think that would be an interesting one just to compare to see yeah. whether, whether there's some slack in that. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Thank you very much. Um, I think your question is helpful. Yes. I think daily versus. Um, Chumbo, can I ask a question? You're <laughs> next. <laughs> yes. Uh, on the daily versus seasonal, I mean, you mentioned that your data is not. Uh, mm. So, if you are a trader, daily is meaningful, but if you are a farmer, uh, maybe monthly is fine. But just a quick question on your research. Mm -hmm. um, so, you are using this entropy method mm -hmm. to come with a density. Mm -hmm. And the reason you would want to make your own density is because you want something more flexible than the standard one. So if you take a gamma or something, you know, it could have some issues. But you, you are hoping for some, something more flexible. Okay. But what that's going to be is a variability. So the question is in terms of the value you are getting. So if you ask me what the price of wheat will be next season, the, the laziest thing I can do is take all the data from the last 20 years and just do a probability plot, a histogram and say, the probability that it will be between this and this is here, okay? Mm -hmm. But you are trying to improve on that because you are trying to come up with something that's forward looking because that's why you look at rainfall and so on. And the, the people doing time series probably have their own way of doing this. Uh, maybe the people doing modeling, trade modeling, will have their own way of doing this. Use is adding this element of the um, maximum entropy stuff. But in terms of what's driving the price, there will be a lot of other things that um, are, are structure, right? More important than the density. So when you think of the density distribution, you got to be careful in terms of the effort you put into that. Because even if you estimate a density, how much better is that going to be than a standard one like that? Mm -hmm. okay, so just thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly take that on board. And there's also no reason why I can't do both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's also a question. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah, and then the uh, to what uh, Ben was trying to allude. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what you need to do about that is uh, look at the literature mm -hmm. on commodity price forecasting because, uh, look, approaching this from an economic point of view as an economist, uh, and an economist, you normally have what's called fundamental analysis. The fundamental analysis simply tells us that uh, the price is simply going to be determined by demand and supply. Those are the main factors that really will be driving uh, the model. And so, uh, when you are trying to model like that, what you just have is the price, okay? And what you're trying to do is that you're trying to forecast the price. So the question you need to be asking yourself is, uh, what really will be driving that price? The variables that you have there, are they really relevant in trying to explain? For instance, if you're here in Australia, the price of wheat is determined by what goes on in the international market, okay? So as much as you sit down and you try to model it, as an economist, the first thing I say is that how useful is that? Because whatever variable you put in there, local variable rate for what? That is not what determines the price. The price we know that is determined by what is going on in the international market. What's going on in Russia, they have a drought that is going to affect uh, the price. What's going on in the US, in Canada, in other countries, that is going to affect the price. So you really then have a very big dilemma on those variables that you're putting in there. The second thing is uh, we know uh, this, what we call the efficient market hypothesis. And it simply tells us that uh, when you look at that price, most likely you cannot be able to beat it because any other information that you want to pick, an oil price or what, it's already been captured in that price. So when you have that price, okay, uh, it's almost like uh, when you go to the commodity exchange, we have uh, people who are looking at demand right now, they are looking at supply, how it's going to be, we have speculators. And uh, based on that, there is the price discovery. So the price is not determined, but the price is being discovered. And that information is already out there. And we expect that there's going to be a very strong correlation between maybe the price, if you look at the price in Chicago market or Australia Security Exchange, the local price here, they are going to be very strongly correlated. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I'm still asking myself, why are you trying, because what you're trying to do is that you're trying to look at this price and you're trying to disentangle this price and asking this question, what is really driving that price? Okay. I'm not sure whether that should really be then your question. Uh, I'm still struggling uh, with, with that. Uh, uh, I can understand maybe why you want to do forecasting or you want to do risk. Uh, you can do those, but do you really need to disentangle and try to see what is driving the price? So I, um, my suggestion is just go back to economics and ask yourself, how is that price determined? Sure. And then let that guide you as to, do you really need to control all these things when you are trying to disentangle that price or not? And maybe to answer your question, when you looked at even most of the studies will say that uh, they just focus on point estimates rather than doing the densities. And, uh, and, and the question is why, I think you have answered it because when you think about price volatility, even right now, if you just go to the commodity exchange, Australian Security Exchange, uh, Chicago Board of Trade, look at the price, at any single moment, even in a day, you'll find that the price is varying. So it's not like just a point. So maybe when you see, those uh, studies that you're reviewing, ask yourself, what price are they using? Maybe they're using the, the settlement price, the average price for that particular day. That is what they are using when they're doing their, their forecasting. And so it goes back again to what Ben is saying. So when you try to build this density, what really are you trying to capture? So I, I still think that maybe you need to read things about the economics of what you're trying to model, and that is going to simplify your work so that you don't do something and then later you look back and you cannot be able to explain what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there, there were quite a few points you touched on there. So thank you um, for, for taking the time to give us feedback. That, so that's certainly something that I'll look into. Um, I'm not really sure how to respond. I mean, our jumbo. Yeah, so um, 
So I, I guess um, from the literature perspective, like this is just a kind of discussion, right? So I don't really know if people can kind of ask me some questions here. So when I look at the agricultural commodity price forecast in the literature, when you talk about the supply and demand and having those sorts of models, I'm wondering if you're talking about like structural econometric models. Well, those would be the models that uh, maybe you try to use to look at uh, what are the fundamentals that are driving mm. either demand or supply. Mm. But in your case, you're trying to look at the price. Mm. You're trying to look at the price. And so uh, when you're looking at the price, my, my argument is uh, you are trying to disentangle what is driving that price. But really, the variables that you want to use, are they relevant mm -hmm. in the first place okay. in explaining what the price is? And my argument is that maybe not. Yes. Yes, because you're saying that's just supply and demand. The four year variables are fine. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we move on? I, I, I do. I'm aware that there's someone on Zoom. I think Piana has yeah. a question. Yeah. Piana, can you ask your question now? Sorry about the wait. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh. Hi. Thanks for thanks very much. Sorry, I was a bit late. Um, really interesting talk, and I'm really interested to follow your um, PhD topic. Um, oh, I had quite a few questions, but I know with time, I'll just distill it down to one. Perhaps, um, perhaps like it's kind of sounding to me like perhaps you need to take a step back and and talk to some of the experts. Um, in the industry, including farmers who monitor prices on a daily basis, um, to really get a handle for what they're selling. Um, <clears throat> for example, you know what what is their um, selling behaviour? What what sort of do they perceive are some of the drivers of price? Because um, we do see price fluctuations at say at a global scale, um, but there are also local effects or local things that influence price. Um, such as, you know, during harvest, there'll be a ship waiting in port um, that needs, you know, I don't know, a couple of extra hundred tonnes of grain before it can leave. And you'll often see the price spike. So it'll be like a daily spike because um, as they're trying to fill ships. Um, so there's definitely those different sort of scales of um, effects on price. Um, yeah, but I would think it would be a good thing to, to go and um, perhaps talk to some farmers and some of the traders um, to get a better understanding on, on how they make de decisions and what are their perceptions on um, on what drives price. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, and I certainly um, plan to do that. One of my supervisors uh, is actually in agriculture from a management perspective, and I will be talking to some farmers at some point um, soon. I've been talking to others in industry who kind of forecast price or um, yeah, that kind of thing. But that's certainly a really interesting thing. Um, so full disclosure, my background is not agriculture um, in any way whatsoever. So this is quite new. Yes. So I really appreciate, you know, the feedback and the opportunity to come here was to kind of have those questions asked um, so that I can address them now rather than when I try to publish papers or submit my thesis. Um, also, um, another little disclosure is that um, I'm mostly, so my last degree was actually mathematics and statistics, so that probably explains, um, although I do have a degree in economics as well, but it's from a very long time ago, um, but it probably does explain my interest in the modelling side, if that makes sense, and the time theory sorts of things as well. Um, so, yeah, like just thank you to Fiona and everyone who's given me that feedback around it, because there's certainly questions that I... Um, yeah, I didn't know to ask in the first place. So. Uh, yeah, any more Zoom questions? No, it's just, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just only be a problem for me. I think that the drivers you're getting in there are the things that you're thinking of driving supply and demand. So, and the question about, again, like anything about if you're all international, well, you're a large country in the wheat market, so actually, droughts here probably are going to shift. World prices and local prices as well. So I think what you're trying to do is actually explore one of those, which of those variables are actually dropping up causal. So I think that's mm, right. Yeah. Just on the question of how far ahead you need to forecast, I think it's going to vary depending on the decision and who's making it. Yeah. 
you know, it's a farmer thinking about whether they want to plant a wheat crop or how much fertilizer to put on is interested in the price that they'll get for that wheat crop in six months time after it's harvested. Mm. Whereas a grain trader could be trying to do stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and everything in between. Thank you. Yeah. So, so they're all possibly relevant. Yes. So you could choose whatever you like in yeah. a sense. Yeah, well, that's the conundrum yeah. I'm thinking. But if, but if you thought you wanted to do something yeah. that was useful for farmers, it's probably yeah. more long-term. Although that's not totally true because sometimes farmers are yeah. holding on to livestock to yeah, exactly. grain on their property and they are interested in the day-to-day -day uh -huh. fluctuations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I guess I'll just, um, another thing is I kind of see what happens if I progress with the modelling and so on. That's another thing that can really change the course of things. Um, so that's, thank you very much. Um, that makes me feel a little bit more secure in mm -hmm. producing different types of forecasts. So I'm sorry, it's been a forecast to that. Yeah, Father Lucia just said she has a few more questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so I'll pass your email address. Please do, yeah, because yeah, you've got my email. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And I would love to talk to Fiona. Um, what is Fiona? Sorry, I can't, I can't so, not sure if I can hear it. Fiona's a farmer. Farmer, okay. And, uh, oh, so, and, yeah. and, and, and an agricultural yeah. economist. Wow. Yeah, I mean, amazing, Fiona. If, yeah. Like, if you have time, I'd love to have a chat to you because that would be really meaningful to me. Thank you. Could you, could you please join me thanking Silva for that? <laughs> Then you can present the results when you have them. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They'll probably be very different from what I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure many, I know some of you have PhD students and so on here. So I know it, it evolves over time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much.